It seems that Uranus is the most neglected of planets. All the others have something remarkable that makes them scientifically appetizing for the exploratory cravings of our species. Mercury is closest to the Sun, Venus the closest to Earth, Mars the most known, Jupiter the largest, Saturn has rings, Neptune is the farthest giant, and Pluto is the most beloved. And all these objects, except for Mercury and Venus, also have one or more large satellites, which makes them extremely interesting to astronomers and space mission planners. Pluto has Charon, Neptune has Triton, Saturn has Titan, Jupiter has Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, Earth has the Moon. Uranus is the only gas giant without a large satellite. Why? Still, it's not known. So what? Is Uranus forgotten just because it has nothing particularly interesting to offer? No, of course not. Someone, joking but not too much, says that the planet suffers from the disadvantage of having a difficult name, which in English is practically unpronounceable because it lends itself to bad jokes. In short, in the English-speaking world, the pronunciation of Uranus would sound decidedly bad, so people would avoid mentioning the planet. Something that might be true in barroom chats, but certainly not in scientific circles. It is true, however, that space agencies in recent decades have sent various probes to investigate the planets of the solar system. Yet it seems that every time new missions are proposed, Uranus is bypassed, even ignored more than its distant twin Neptune. To date, only one probe has visited this planet, and it was Voyager 2, which passed close to it in 1986 only to gain momentum and head towards Neptune. At the time of Voyager, Uranus had a notoriously bland appearance. It was called the Blue Billiard Ball, and so few atmospheric features were observed that the Voyager Atmospheric Science team thought to give up some of their precious observation time to other teams. Is this perhaps why there is so little interest in exploring this planet? Is it so difficult to reach, or simply does it have nothing to offer? No. Despite its bad reputation and the few exploratory missions, we have then managed to understand that Uranus is not a boring planet at all. On the contrary, it is one of the strangest and most exciting planets. And as we will see at the end of this extraordinary video, its scientific importance is continually growing. Are you curious to try to follow us to the end and find out what has changed the minds of planetologists? Okay, let's start then. As we just said, Uranus is not a boring planet. On the contrary, it is a fascinating and unique planet. It is the third largest planet and the fourth by mass. It was the first planet, obviously after Saturn, around which we discovered a ring system in 1977. And it has the unique peculiarity of having a rotation axis inclined by 97 degrees to the orbital plane. As if to say that Uranus rolls on the plane of its orbit rather than turning like more or less all the other planets. However, there is a significant reason why, in the entire history of space exploration, only one mission has visited Uranus. Getting there is a genuinely long and challenging endeavor. The planet is located almost 3 billion kilometers from the Sun, 20 times farther than Earth. But this is perhaps one of the minor problems, especially since Neptune and Pluto are much farther away. To understand the reason for such difficulty, let's take a step back to the days when Voyager 2, it was January 1986, exactly 38 years ago, was about to reach the planet after an endless journey of 10.5 billion kilometers. Yes, you heard it right. Although Uranus, as we just mentioned, is 3 billion kilometers away from the Sun, Voyager 2 has traveled more than three times that distance by then. This is because in space, one practically never travels in a straight line, and the probe needed continuous gravitational assist to increase its speed and adjust its course. These assists were obtained by stealing kinetic energy from massive planets that it could approach, deviating from its trajectory. This increased speed, true, but it also increased the distance to cover due to the necessary detours. So was it really worth it? The calculations are complicated, but we can assure you that without the assist from Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 2 would have taken about 12 years to reach Uranus. Instead, it only took 9 years, saving time, fuel, and resources. 
This demonstrates that gravitational assistance is a very advantageous technique for space missions, despite its disadvantages. Not to mention that without the course changes imposed by the two flybys with the gas giants, the probe would have never been able to visit all four gas giants of the solar system successively. At this point, someone might object. Okay, Voyager 2 took nine years to reach Uranus. But how come the New Horizons probe reached Pluto, which is twice as far as Uranus, in just six years? The difference in time between the two space missions depends on various factors, including speed, trajectory, and probe maneuvers. The New Horizons probe was launched in 2006 with an initial speed of about 58,000 km per hour, the highest ever achieved by a probe. Additionally, it utilized a gravitational assist from Jupiter, which allowed it to increase its speed by about 14,000 km per hour and save time and fuel on a path that enabled it to reach Pluto in 2015 after a journey of about 5 billion kilometers. Voyager 2, on the other hand, was launched in 1977 with an initial speed of about 35,000 km per hour, lower than that of New Horizons. Also, as we've seen, it followed a more complex trajectory. Before moving on, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Make sure to hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on our daily videos. But it's not just a matter of speed. Another limiting factor for all spacecraft sent to the outer reaches of the solar system is the diminishing sunlight as you move away from our star. At certain distances, solar panels become entirely useless in generating energy. Therefore, the mission must inevitably use a source of nuclear power namely a nuclear battery that would end up weighing down the spacecraft, reducing its speed. Another problem that adds up is communication with Earth, which at the distance of Uranus would involve receiving signals with a 2.6 hour delay and reaction times to a possible problem of 5.2 hours. This is a delicate matter, especially considering that the insertion of a spacecraft into orbit around the planet would have to be conducted automatically without human intervention. Additionally, we must remember that putting a probe into orbit around Uranus would be doubly challenging due to its axial orientation. Another significant but often overlooked obstacle is keeping both the engineering mission teams and the operational teams together for the entire time needed to complete the mission. In the case of Uranus, it can take up to a decade between the launch and the arrival of the spacecraft on the planet, and even two decades if we consider the start of the design. Although it might seem insignificant, this problem is the reason why many missions have had to be cancelled. Others have faced delays of years because the team that began working on a mission was not the same that completed it. This is because crucial information or codes are often lost in the transition from one generation of technicians to another. This is precisely what happened with the Voyager probes, which used VHS-type films to send images, and software specially made for this task was responsible for their encoding here on Earth. The equipment that performed that task, the software, and the people who knew how to use them no longer exist. So today it would be impossible to retrieve images from the Voyager cameras, even if they were still operational. Another example of this problem can be seen in the recent Artemis 1 mission aiming to bring the next generation of astronauts to the moon. Many people wondered why there was a need to rebuild everything from scratch, ignoring what was done during the Apollo era. Again, the reason is that all that information has been lost. The people who knew the computer codes, passwords, and those who made the designs and mathematical calculations, most of them have long since passed away. No knowledge can work forever, regardless of the passage of time. Every space mission is a case of its own, realized by technicians and scientists who applied solutions that are now indecipherable. Sad, but that's how it is. Today, we couldn't simply clone the missions carried out by the two Voyagers. They would have to be redesigned from scratch, of course improving upon them. So far, this has been a considerable obstacle to the willingness to explore again towards Uranus and Neptune. However, we haven't yet addressed the reason why this willingness has been strengthening in recent years. The short answer is that, in the meantime, we've started discovering extrasolar planets, and astronomers are increasingly realizing that planets like Uranus are the most common in the solar systems of our galaxy. The long answer is that Uranus belongs to the class of planets that astronomers call ice giants, because they are formed from a large amount of volatile material such as water, ammonia, and methane, elements found in solid or liquid states under the atmosphere made of hydrogen and helium. 
These planets differ from gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, which are predominantly composed of hydrogen and helium, and from rocky planets like Earth and Mars, which have a solid core and a solid or liquid surface. Uranus and Neptune are the only two ice giants in our solar system, but observations in recent years have revealed that this class of planets is very common in our galaxy. Thanks to various detection methods such as transit, radio velocity, and gravitational microlensing, astronomers have discovered thousands of extrasolar planets, many of which have sizes and masses similar to Uranus and Neptune. These planets are often called mini-Neptunes or super-Earths, depending on whether they are larger or smaller than Earth, but in reality, they could be ice giants. Studying Uranus up close might be necessary to understand how these planets, likely the most numerous in our galaxy, form and evolve. In particular, Uranus could provide information on the following issues. How does an ice giant form? What factors determine its composition, structure, climate, and magnetic field? What is the role of planetary migration, i.e. the movement of planets from their original positions due to gravitational interactions with other celestial bodies? How does an ice giant evolve? How does its orbit, rotation axis, atmosphere, and geological activity change over time? What are the effects of tides, collisions, radiation, and stellar disturbances? How does a system of satellites form around an ice giant? What are the physical and dynamic characteristics of these satellites? What are the chances that some of them have conditions favorable for life, such as underground oceans or energy sources? These are just some of the questions scientists have about Uranus and similar planets, and they could potentially be answered with a dedicated space mission. A mission to Uranus could offer us a detailed and in-depth view of this enigmatic world and its numerous satellites, some of which might harbor underground oceans. A mission to Uranus could also help us compare the characteristics of this planet with those of Neptune, the other ice giant in our solar system, and with those of extrasolar planets of the same class, to understand the similarities and differences between these worlds. Over the years, several missions to Uranus have been proposed, later cancelled in favor of other missions deemed more scientifically valuable. But now, based on incredible discoveries in planetary systems around other stars, it seems that NASA is convinced to take it seriously. Thus, the Uranus Orbiter and Probe Project was born, a joint proposal between NASA and ESA to reach Uranus with an orbit that will also release a probe into its atmosphere somewhat akin to what Cassini and Huygens did on Saturn and Titan in 2005. Remember that? Experts estimate that the journey will last 12 to 15 years, mainly depending on the launch date which will determine the distance between the two planets. Uranus and Neptune are the only planets that have never been studied with a dedicated orbital mission, and missions to these planets have been deemed a priority for the next decade mainly due to the potential to produce revolutionary science on a wide range of topics. The best launch opportunities for the mission would be in June of 2031 and April of 2032, windows that could benefit from the gravitational boost of Jupiter to position the spacecraft in orbit around Uranus after a cruise of about 13 years. But to be ready for these dates, the mission should start in 2024. The estimated cost of the mission is around $4.2 billion. Other launch opportunities between 2032 and 2038 and beyond will have to use multiple gravitational assists from inner planets of the solar system, including a Venus flyby, to position the vehicle in orbit with a cruise time of about 15 years. The end of the ideal launch window is in 2038, which would require a 15-year journey due to Uranus's position. Unfortunately, NASA recently postponed the launch due to a decrease in plutonium production meaning a launch in the mid to late 30s is more likely. A real pity, but until we find better propulsion methods than those currently available, we'll have to resign ourselves to aging in the hope of witnessing the conclusion of these incredible adventures in person. Let time do its thing, and in the meantime, let's focus on the exciting prospects of upcoming lunar and Martian missions.